Guns of World War I fell silent on the Western Front in November 1918. It was the moment for US President Woodrow Wilson to speak his mind. Wilson wanted nations in Eastern Europe and elsewhere to become independent, and he was a prime mover in spreading the idea of nationalism. National movements in Asia and in the rest of the world now achieved almost universal success. The Earth's entire land area became covered by national states. This rearrangement of our globe has excluded many smaller societies, and such small societies are often treated badly by the majority. They produce little significant writing or literature, yet they are important in the history of human religions, and their spiritual experience is often profound. Many of the smaller peoples of the world still exist by hunting and gathering. Others are agricultural and pastoral peoples. Surrounded by powerful industrial and often technological societies, these smaller peoples are threatened with extinction or assimilation as they lose the land that provides their means of living. Small societies also hold special clues about many phases of the human past. Before cities grew up about 5,000 years ago, in the Middle Eastern regions that are now Egypt, Iraq and Syria, most of humanity lived in ways resembling those of today's smaller, non-literate cultures. This was a time before agriculture had advanced enough for farmers to produce the surpluses that are necessary for cities to exist. There are relatively few small society groups in Europe and in the Near East because Christianity and Islam have so thoroughly dominated these areas since ancient times. Only the European Arctic remains an exception. But we will be able to discuss a few examples of Europe's ancient pre-literate religions among the many places and societies we'll encounter. Each small society has its own strands of thinking and its own particular experience. Whether they tread across the ice, go into the forest, walk across the desert, or roam among savanna grasses. Small societies have an especially strong sense of bonding with their environment. One of the most important and central figures in small society religion is the shaman. The word shaman itself comes from Siberia. It signifies a kind of prophet who is prone to have spiritual experiences and visions, and who is trained to become a religious leader. The shaman is often a person in a hunting and gathering society who is gifted with discerning where the fish or the animals or the berries are richest. Typically, a shaman is a male, though some societies may have a female shaman. Shamans are healers who use spiritual methods to help those who are ailing. The term medicine man essentially refers to a shaman among North American or other Aboriginal peoples. Shamans also are community visionaries who help to communicate between heaven and earth. Like priests, they conduct ceremonies and they maintain the traditions of the group. A shaman's roles may include those of a healer, 
a magician, a priest, and a psychic. Small societies experience a world that is much more eager to respond to humans. It is peopled with spirits with whom one can enter into relationships and ancestors exist in a nearby place. These spirits are manifested in mountains, stars, rivers, the sun, plants, animals, and so on. Modern scholars call this outlook animism. Though there are many gods and supernatural beings, smaller societies usually see a supreme god or goddess presiding over all. Among the Ainu people in northern Japan, there is a complex hierarchy of spirits, both good and evil. The greatest of their sky gods is the sun. The moon is regarded as the sun's wife. When the moon is invisible, it means she has gone to visit with her husband. On Earth, the Ainu believe the highest god is fire. In small society religions, the supreme divinity is often withdrawn. Because of this, there is no sacrifice or other special ritual associated with the high god. Lesser spirits are more likely to be intimately concerned with human and animal affairs but the High God will be a significant presence in people's thoughts. The gods and spirits of small societies also can be seen as the souls of some earthly material object. This means that the Fire God animates fire wherever it is found. The Bear God animates bears. The Sea God animates the sea. In effect, each earthly manifestation of that god expresses the god's spirit. The high god tends to have certain characteristics in almost all cultures, especially small ones. First, a supreme god typically is not associated with a ritual cult because this god is believed to be much too unconcerned with human beings. Humans are created, cared for, rewarded and punished by lesser deities. The high god lives in a heavenly realm and typically does not come to earth. He or she may be thought to dwell in high regions of the sky, thus having no direct contact with human beings. The small traditional society, the world trodden by the shaman, contains powerful forces that inspire fear and joy, attraction and repulsion. In short, forces that inspire awe. The religious world of small societies, a world of shamans, subordinate deities, and a high god, ever-present ancestors, animistic spirits, and the living dead, presents a picture of reality that's quite different from what we moderns are used to. In modern societies, humans are thought to be set against nature. The natural world is drained of its god. we have to exercise our imagination. We have to think of the gods as living in our midst, in the thunder, the trees, the rivers and mountains, the bears and leopards. Somehow, it's not too easy to imagine the gods under the street lights lit by electricity and powered by nuclear fuel. In bright cities, we cannot see the stars. Divine mystery and power are harder to come by in a modern world that has lit up the night, traveled to the moon, and cured major diseases. In many small societies, the shaman is an elite figure, drawn to his profession either because of heredity or because he has had a vision or especially significant dreams. The vision may have been helped on its way by ascetic practices such as submitting oneself to great cold or heat for example, sweat lodges are used by Northern European, North American and Siberian peoples. This is a kind of tent or hut with heated stones in it. It is the precursor of the sauna, which modern Westerners have demystified and converted into a tool for pursuing physical well-being. All shamans must show visionary prowess. Among many native North Americans, there is a well-established tradition of the vision quest, in which a young person goes to live alone in a wild and spiritually significant place. 
here, the potential shaman hopes that an appropriate dream or vision will certify his or her visionary potential. A shaman in training also receives instruction in medicines and plant life, learning techniques for warding off death or restoring the dead to life. The dream adventures of this shaman also give him knowledge of other worlds. This will stand him in good stead in his future vocation. He is now a healer, and he also is what the Greeks called a psychopompos, or leader of souls. The Greek god Orpheus, the divine musician whose music can charm birds, animals, humans and gods, goes to the underworld to retrieve his wife Eurydice, who has died of a snake bite. He is allowed to take her back to the mortal world if he leads the way and she follows behind. But there is one fatal condition, that Orpheus must not look at Eurydice during the journey back. Despite this command, he looks at her at the last moment and loses her forever. In many cultures, sacred specialists also wear masks. These indicate a change of identity as the holy man takes on the guise of a divine being during sacred services. This is a mask of the Basonge people in, in Zaire. It is called the Kifwebi mask, and that means the mask. And indeed, this is uh, considered to be the most efficacious healing mask in all of Africa. It has a magnificent uh, formology. Uh, its general shape is intended to show that of a lizard. And most significantly, this pursed mouth over here is to show the capacity of the mask to uh, pull fever out of, uh, out of victims. This is a Mendi mask from the Bundu society. It is one of the few masks that is entirely made for women to wear. Not so long ago, in the course of describing these masks, uh, we were inclined to say that the physiognomy of the face was that which was aesthetically pleasing to the husbands of the Mendi women. However, we know now that the broad forehead is not a physical defect, but rather to show the great imaginative and intelligence of, of the women. The, the smallness of the face here is to show, in comparison to the, to, to the brow, that the beauty of the face and the intelligence and the imagination are intended to be balanced. In general, then, the dress of the shaman is a sign of his intimate connection with the world's sacred forces. The costume is a main focus for how the gods and spirits are represented. In many civilizations, we look for images of gods and saints in temples. But here, it's as if the shaman is the temple. We might add that not all of the spiritual elite fulfill the complete role of the shaman, but some elements of the shamanic pattern can be found in a large number of societies. Sometimes there is a visionary prophet who does not involve himself in healing, yet he communicates between spirits and human beings. A priest performs ceremonies, but he may not have the same degree of experience or expertise in matters of religious experience. There are many ways in which the cosmos is believed to have come into being. Perhaps the most typical account is that the world arose out of some kind of a blank or nothingness, brought into being by a creator or creators. The Salknam peoples, who live on Tierra del Fuego, off the southern tip of South America, believed that the supreme being, Temalkel, created the starry sky above and an unformed earth. A lesser deity then came into being to form the human condition. The Salknam believed that these early people did not die. Apparently, death was a beautiful sleep from which a revitalized person would re-emerge and grow old again. When individuals wanted to give up their succession of lives, they would become another entity, like a star or a gull or a sea lion or a mountain. Even after creation, the full human condition is not realized until death comes into the world. And myths 
attempt to explain this as well. It is a common theme that some choice or action by the first human beings brought death into the world. One variation is that the first humans made the high god angry, causing him to draw farther away. This explains why the sky is so far above the human race. Many cultures talk of other spiritual denizens, such as ghosts, and societies usually have rituals associated with the spirits of their ancestors. These rituals are often described as ancestor worship, but this term is somewhat inappropriate. Though ancestors usually are revered, they are usually not worshipped as gods. If the dead are feared, it is because some haunting spirit is believed to have been denied the rituals needed to lead them safely to the next world. In ancient Rome, the deceased were believed to lose their individuality as they simply merged with the so-called demanes, or ancestral gods of the underworld. Unlike most cultures, the ancient Romans believed that ancestors really became gods and the dead were believed to be collectively divine. Sacrifices were thrown into trenches in the Roman Forum and elsewhere during festivals for the dead. The trenches were means of communicating with the underworld in a rather literal way. People in the West generally don't think of themselves as having an ancestor cult. But the communion of saints among Roman Catholics and other Christians is actually quite analogous to ancestor worship. Deceased Roman Catholics are regarded as part of the wider church, the universal church, which embraces those living dead whose faith has brought them into the presence of God. From a different age in a different part of the world is the bear sacrifice of the Ainu, the aboriginal people of northernmost Japan. Very often, a cub has been fattened and pampered. At this stage, young Ainu are given the adventure of capturing this cub, and their efforts bring prowess. The cub may even be brought up in the house, but when it gets big, rough and sharp clawed, it is then confined in a stout cage. Here the cub is made ready for the culminating event of its life, namely its death. Sacrifice of animals is often associated with eating, partly because fire is so often associated with sacrificial acts. According to symbolic thinking, fire helps to convey things upwards. The gods are often thought to dwell in the sky, and they are invisible. It is thus singularly appropriate to burn objects so that their essence is sent upwards to the divine realm. Those who sacrifice are therefore giving up something important. Like all gifts, it is meaningless if it has no worth. Generally, a sacrifice is offered to influence the mood of a spirit, but it might be given simply because the sacrificer believes it is owed. Sacrifices are made to ensure that a particular god stands in the right relationship to the sacrificer. Some offerings are ultimately intended to ensure a rainfall or fertile crops or a victorious battle. So sacrifices cover natural changes and other earthly events that benefit the individual or group. They may help with social change, or they may expiate some sin or broken taboo. A number of peoples have until recently sacrificed humans. This can often include elements of cannibalism for fairly obvious reasons. Just as consuming an animal's flesh is often thought to empower the one who consumes it, Eating an enemy chieftain's head or heart might convey his courage and strength to the killing victor and his group. Human sacrifice was widespread in Central America, for instance, among the Aztecs, Caribs, and others. The logic of this practice was that the offering was peculiarly valuable or potent. So the Aztecs treated an honored human victim respectfully and gave him a good life as long as it lasted. The Aztecs also apparently believed that the young man to be sacrificed would become a god after his death. This means that the rituals, privileges and honors given might be intended to acknowledge or confer a divine status on the god-to-be as he passed from this life to the next. As we've seen, not all sacrifices involve the killing of humans or animals. Many involve plants or even a gift of some artifacts. The important thing is the value of what is given. 
And not all rituals involve sacrifices. As we noted earlier, the shaman is also a healer, and this role requires certain rituals. Other ancient rites that have persisted in indigenous societies include forms of magic, manipulating the sacred forces inherent in the natural world, healing methods through medicine men and women, magic, divination, and the use of oracles. In fact, it looks as if a spectrum of similar practices once spread across the world, producing a kind of quilt of diverse religions that shared overlapping themes. Such a system apparently covered the whole planet before and during the rise of great urban civilizations. There has been a long debate among anthropologists and other scholars about the differences between magic and religion. The distinction is often hard to maintain. While those of us in advanced technological cultures tend to be skeptical about magic, we usually fail to notice that magical formulae are quite reasonable within a worldview that doesn't involve modern scientific assumptions. Magic often employs sacred formulae like prayers. People might pray for rain because they think the sky god controls the rain clouds or they might try to manipulate a secret power in the rain clouds. In some societies, a certain formula is believed to bring rain whether or not the rain god wishes it. Divination includes the notion that like affects like. When you're looking at means of divination, you need to look at the energy behind it. You need to realize that the method of divination, whether it's tarot cards or runes or chicken bones, or, you know, reading drops of blood as, as the Santorians have done in the past. All of those are just a means of accessing energy. So you're not really reading what it is that you're using for a tool. You're actually reading the energy behind it. So when you're doing divination, it's actually a way to connect with spirit or universal consciousness or God or whatever you want to call it and bringing forth knowledge about whatever the specific issue is. Often people try to divine an answer by posing a question and then performing some physical action like casting a stone. If the stone lands on one side, the answer is yes. If on the other side, the answer is no. Such mechanical means of divination are very widespread. They can be important even in literate and large-scale traditions, as in tarot cards. Many people also embrace augury, which is a belief in omens. Here, sights or sounds, such as those from birds, are believed to indicate something about the future. The rituals of magic often include the practice of witchcraft. If a person has a misfortune or falls sick, it may well be attributed to the malicious work of a witch. The art of divination, that is, reading oracles, omens and prophecies, often includes trying to identify the malefactor, so countermeasures can be taken. Some writers in the West like to clearly distinguish between black magic, which involves evil intent, and white magic. A lot of people make a distinction between white magic and black magic. Magic is magic. There is absolutely no difference. If you consider that magic is exactly like electricity, electricity follows the shortest path. Magic has its own path and its own, its own flow. How that flow is directed or tapped into determines whether or not it's being used for the highest good or to suit someone else's individual purposes. It's all with the intent with which it is wielded. If it's being directed to harm someone and that harm directly benefits somebody, that's what most people would categorize as black magic, whereas white magic would be more in the healing end of things, using magic to heal, but in fact it's, it's all what you do with it. I mean a hammer is just a hammer. You can use it to hang a picture, you can use it to crush somebody's skull, and magic is the same way. In fact, the word witch comes from the Anglo-Saxon word wicca, referring to a wise one. Wicca is not Satanism. We do not eat babies, we do not make human or animal sacrifice. Um, a lot of the, the stereotypes that people see today come straight out of 
what's been propagated by Hollywood. Wicca is an earth-based nature religion that honors the faces of deity in terms of the, the god and the goddess. And people inside of Wicca are, are people who honor the earth. Witchcraft incorporates a belief in what may be called analogical causation. This means that someone can influence others by natural means, such as piercing a doll that looks like or analogizes the intended victim. This is what most people would commonly think of as a poppet or a voodoo doll. While the tradition of voodoo does use um, dolls that can represent the person uh, that is being worked on, has a lot of negative connotations. Something of this nature can not only be used to harm someone, but it can also be used for healing, which is what it was originally developed for. Using this to focus on, the, to represent the person who requires healing and placing stones or having something tangible to visualize the healing. So it does have positive, very positive connotations as well as, as negative. Usually, when we think of religion, morality is not far behind. So it may be surprising to learn that in many small societies, there is often little, if any, connection between religion and morality. Even the gods themselves do not necessarily act in noble ways. Of course, some primitive societies interpret frightening events like thunder and lightning to be capricious acts of the gods. Sometimes these events are understood as punishment for human error or transgressions, or perhaps for violating taboos. Frightening events also are sometimes understood as divine revenge, which of course is a divine motivation that has little or no moral merit. And we must remember that not all spirits are seen as good. So there are the malicious or hostile acts of yet other spirits in this wider society of people, ancestors and gods. Moral decisions reflect a belief system that's usually derived from a religious tradition or from some secular substitute for religious faith. So it should not be surprising that many indigenous peoples see morals, customs and taboos as part of a wider worldview that includes much of what we nowadays call religion. The fact is that for most small societies, wrong behavior is that which endangers the group. Societies also generally condemn actions that might endanger or impair society. Yet in a small society that includes both ancestors and gods, the distinction between socially sanctioned and religiously sanctioned rules is not easy to make. Small societies also can follow a variety of sexual moralities. There is arranged marriage, marriage by capture, temporary marriage, premarital cohabiting, and in some groups there are even marriages between brothers and sisters. A group can be polyandrous, where a woman has many husbands, or it can be polygynous, where the man has many wives. Small societies have endured in both cases. While adultery is typically banned and may even spark severe vendettas in some societies, they are societies where the wife is offered to guests, for example among the Inuit. Westerners have heavily criticized what they call primitive ethics because they encompass practices such as cannibalism and human sacrifice. Though only a minority of societies practice them. The, the idea of, of sacrifice, which is uh, one that the, that the early uh, uh, Christian missionaries found so objectionable among the Africans, both human sacrifice and animal sacrifice, uh, fundamentally there is no great difference between spilling the blood of a chicken and consuming the wine blood of a, uh, of a crucified savior. In converting people to the Christian faith, missionaries considered themselves to be raising them up towards civilization. Western behavior toward native populations often failed to support their claims to moral superiority. Vulnerable tribesmen were killed indiscriminately. Land was stolen. Native women were forced to become concubines. All of this hardly gave indigenous peoples an elevated sense of Western ethics. Practices such as communion with ancestral spirits are perfectly logical to most members of these small societies. Given their overall worldview 
and their conception of the meaning of sacrifice. Understanding their beliefs and practices requires us to enter their moral world with sympathy and imagination. Yet sometimes our empathy is blocked by a prevalent prejudice in modern Western culture, which says that the beliefs and practices of indigenous peoples are somehow superstitious or outmoded. The idea of superstition itself is open to question because many religions embrace beliefs that cannot be tested or supported with rational methods. The word superstition itself is derived from Latin components meaning stand over or beyond. This may refer to going beyond the limits of rational belief. Though scholars often regard superstitions as a kind of leftover or remnant of a belief from earlier and supposedly more primitive religion. With regard to being outmoded, Many small societies have long regarded the earth and human life to be highly interrelated and integrated, an idea that echoes in modern environmental ethics. So perhaps we should not too hastily conclude that other people's beliefs and rituals are simply outmoded or superstitious. Totemism derives from the word totem, a somewhat mangled form of a word found among the Ojibwe and Algonquian people of North America. Totemism identifies a clan with some object, such as a species, or perhaps some natural phenomenon, such as the sun or the rain. Groups have a special relationship to their totem, and this reinforces their sense of solidarity. Typically, a totem clan is exogamous, meaning that its members marry outside the clan, so there is a natural blending and evolution of religious beliefs and loyalties as patterns of intermarriage play themselves out. A European trace of totemism is found in an Irish clan called Connealy, whose members supposedly were long ago turned into seals. This clan has been said to fear killing or eating a seal. Such an incident would invariably bring ill luck. A more important aspect of small society religion is found in the rites of passage that mark a significant change in someone's life and in their relationship to society. The major transitions are birth, puberty, marriage and death. Each transition is recognized according to custom, ritual traditions and the advisory powers entrusted to the elders, shamans, priests and so on. All of this is organized to ensure the ongoing stability of the group. Many peoples believe that a kind of death is experienced during vital transitions. A person is believed to die to the old life before he or she is resurrected in the new. Life and death is the same. It's a state of rebirth. Neither is greater than the other. One birth is just the same as the other. And so death is just a state of rebirth. Life and, and spirit of man never leaves the universe. It's a universal expression, it's an aura, it's an energy that entwined with all things. And so therefore, physical structure must rest. That the physical garment is just like your clothes, they wear out. And through the different uh, energies that we have to endure, one know the time to slip out of the physical and go into the celestial. The first initiation occurs after birth, when a society ritually incorporates a new human being into the community at large. The ceremony has both a social significance and a sacred one. Socially, a new person is admitted to society, where if all goes well, he will be initiated to adulthood, married, and finally passed to the life beyond death. Spiritually, the child is now considered to have been submitted to and immersed in the stream of living, that is, the waters of life. Yet of all the rites of passage, the most important is that which follows death. Many, if not all, indigenous peoples believe in the survival of ancestors, and funeral ceremonies are meant to ensure safe passage to an afterlife where they can reconnect with the earthly community. In some sense, they will remain part of earthly society. So for indigenous people, the funeral is less of an end and more of an initiation into the next world. Rituals of passage help to maintain stability and order within a community. 
generally speaking, societies that have a richer and more complex ritual dimension have a greater need for specialist performers, that is, priests. For example, priests may be needed to install a chief who derives his authority from the rituals that endow him with new powers. Rituals are an important part of custom and of law, marking out the special offices or changes in status that must be respected in order to achieve social stability. And for young people, initiations impose discipline and even hardship to prepare them for the trials and hardships of adult life. There are many points inside a pagan or a Wiccan's life that are celebrated inside the Wiccan tradition, such as Wiccaning, which is when someone who is an adolescent takes a step out of that adolescence or childhood into adulthood, they take on certain responsibilities. It's a rite of passage into taking your place in the community and being responsible in the community and responsible for the community. Today, we stand before the god and goddess, and I use this sage to smudge both the body and the mind and the spirit. For today, we move forward from that of innocence childhood, crossing into the threshold of womanhood. The shaman influences his community's ideas of time and space, and the way these ideas are understood is an important aspect of the philosophical or doctrinal dimensions of a religion. The gods function in mythic time what the Australian indigenous peoples call dream time. Mythic time is like chronological time, but it is not exactly the same. Just a certain fringes of space are not quite ordinary space. The gods live and act all around us, but they also dwell in these hypertimes and hyperspaces. Because the shaman is understood to overcome time and space when he travels, he's able to link the creation to the present. As religions coalesced and developed over the centuries, some of the ancient motifs began to develop separately. Society became more differentiated and various aspects of shamanic practice and life were reshaped. The largest impact on small-scale societies has occurred during the modern period, when the Earth's land surface has been taken over first by empires then by national states. Where tribes found themselves in coveted areas, they were simply moved or destroyed. The slave trade displaced a number of peoples, wiping out much of their cultures. When the Ottoman Empire was defeated and broken up after World War I, many of its mainly Arab lands became dominated by European powers. This huge cultural revolution hit the indigenous peoples hardest of all. Esconced in their traditional habitat, indigenous peoples have suffered greatly from the shock of the modern colonial era. Colonialism has brought alien diseases, fantastic new techniques and knowledge, missionaries, writing, national government, new religions, new kinds of medicine, and a very different cosmology. Small societies have been expected to digest all these things over a relatively short period. For most of these societies, it has been all they can do to avoid absorption into larger cultures. Many of them still struggle to preserve the structures that have given meaning to their lives. Because the colonial system was imposed on Africa well into the 20th century, uh, it was clear to the African that no matter how Christianized he became, somehow or another, he was deprived of the social and economic advantages of the white Christians in their midst. In fact, one of the, one of the rumors uh, that was common throughout Africa at the turn of the century was that the colonials had kept the true Bible away from the black African, and therefore, somehow or another, he was not able to fully participate in uh, the, the, the culture and the society and the material wealth of the white people around them. Now this disaffection led to a whole stream of prophets uh, and messiahs who rose up from among 
the African uh, groups. Uh, this is a, a tradition, of course, uh, that uh, was brought to its pinnacle by Archbishop Desmond Tutu when he spoke up uh, against the colonial powers. This is precisely what the early messianic and prophetic figures did uh, in Africa. Until the colonial era, political powers usually had left indigenous peoples free to pursue their own customs. But colonial regimes now wished to impose both a unified administrative structure and a uniform educational standard. These moves, in addition to colonial economic influences, had a deep impact upon indigenous peoples, whether in Siberia or Patagonia, central India or Zululand. Warfare and the loss of land brought great trauma to these societies. Sometimes prophecies could be more gently evocative. This was the case with the famous ghost dance. The prophet Wavoka, among the North American Paiute tribe, instructed his followers to dance in a typical ritual. Though Wavoka's message was non-violent, the ghost dance movement sparked armed resistance. It culminated in the tragedy of Wounded Knee in 1890, where 200 men, women and children of the Dakota tribe were gunned down by United States troops in the new state of South Dakota. The Mayan epic entitled Chilam Balam also had this kind of perverse effect because it predicted that the Mayan god Kukul Khan, called Quetzalcoatl by the Aztecs, would one day return to rule. So the bearded Spaniards who sailed in from the east were viewed as godlike. The Mayans were quickly and mercilessly conquered amid much slaughter. Not all of these movements have survived. Yet everywhere they testify to attempts to deal with new and painful challenges. The Zulus had been defeated by the British in 1879 at the Battle of Ulundi, and later legislation had badly affected their land rights. For almost a century, the spirit of the Zulu people had been largely crushed. But we should remember that such expressions of renewal, despair and hope sprung up throughout the world among the many peoples who were threatened by Western expansion. In some small-scale indigenous societies, there is a move beyond new religious movements to the broader concept of mobilizing a whole people or cultural area. What once were multifaceted religions in these regions have tended to grow together. So new voices are being heard from among indigenous peoples. The emerging tendency to group huge cultural regions together may point to a growing self-consciousness among indigenous peoples. In turn, this may lead to a broader, more collective conception of their religions. For example, there is a growing insistence on the interest and concern of indigenous peoples about the environment. The traditional view that nature is animated by spirits itself generates an impulse towards treating nature as a partner. Indigenous peoples are particularly good at coping with their environment, and they know how to live in circumstances very different from those in our technological societies. Over the centuries, the great civilizations have often absorbed elements from older indigenous cultures, transforming their rituals into rites that have new meaning. Despite such timeless similarities between older peoples and modern ones, modern influences can still be shattering. The shaman loses part of his power when the reindeer are not hunted, but rather herded by helicopter for profit. The motorboat outruns the Dayak canoe, and the ancient dairy methods of the Todas in the Nilgiri hills of South India are replaced by more scientific methods of agriculture. The very integration of smaller societies exposes them to guns, new kinds of alcohol, radios, and opportunities to travel. This does not mean that indigenous religions will disappear, though some may. They will no doubt be altered, partly by blending with the larger traditions, 
especially Christianity. They also will be reinterpreted as they are faced by the same forces that have compelled other traditions to be reinterpreted. Their individual meanings may coalesce as they join forces across the world to defend their rights and their traditions. But still we can learn from them. The American naturalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson, put it well. He who wanders in the woods perceives how natural it was to pagan imagination to find gods in every deep grove and by each fountainhead. Nature seems to him not to be silent, but to be eager and striving to break out into music. Each tree, flower, and stone he invests with life and character. And it is impossible that the wind, which breathes so expressive a sound among the leaves, should mean nothing.